Well, we're not surprised we have a good audience today. Welcome all colleagues and friends of Jeff and of this program, Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness, a program in this uh, institution that specializes in um, standard kind of knowledge and um, knowledge gained by other ways of knowing. A very important part of our mission and our serious work together. And you'll probably hear about some of you know that already. Uh, so we hear to hear Jeff, and so you will hear about uh, special kinds of knowledge on the, um, I wouldn't say fringes exactly, but in um, some hard to find places and knowledge that's part one. So my, I'm Robert McDermott, I'm the chair of this department. Uh, it's a department of five faculty with Sean Kelly and uh, Rick Tarnas, who is the founder of the program some 17 years ago now, and then Elizabeth Allison, who is the uh, second reader of the dissertation, and Brian Swim, who is the chair, and Anak, who is on the phone, and there's an external reader, so that as part of our um, sort of not establishing, but confirming <laughs> our serious legitimacy in the academic world. We have, as a pretty much standard practice, we have two, we have a mentor in the department, a second reader in the department, and then we have someone with special knowledge in the field of the dissertation from outside the institution. And then this is a, then there's a defense by the <clears throat> author of the dissertation, and it is a public event. Uh, it's lots of work uh, on a dissertation is a, a lonely and private person at home or wherever writing, but this is a public event and indeed it's an institutional event of great standing after all the academic institutions uh, came into being in Europe in um, all the major capitals of Europe a thousand years ago. So it's a long lineage and there really is a a um, fellowship or a community of scholars, uh, and that's with that PhD, a doctor of philosophy in many different fields. In this case, it's a doctor of philosophy of philosophy of religion with a specialization in cosmology, in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. So uh, this is what will happen. Uh, Jeff will uh, summarize and. Um, we use the word defend, um, but it's, it's presenting in a convincing way the results of his research. And then uh, the uh, uh, committee members, Brian and Elizabeth and Anak, will ask questions to which we uh, hope and expect that Jeff will be able to give good answers. And then the, uh, they may go around again, we don't know. And then the committee uh, will go to another room and consult on the results of the, the defense. So it's serious. Uh, <laughs> uh, he doesn't scare easily, as we know. But, uh, <laughs> but it is serious. I mean, people fail um, uh, because, well, who knows? But um, we are looking forward to that. We're not expecting that. But it is serious. A, a, a level of uh, competence has to be attained and demonstrated. Okay. So when the committee comes back, uh, uh, Brian, as the chair, will announce the results of the discussion. <clears throat> and uh, it, uh, the dissertation could fail, or the defense could fail. These are two different categories. They're related, but they're not the same. Uh, they could decide that uh, he did a terrific job presenting, but the dissertation really has serious weaknesses or it's not convincing or something. Then um, a, a lesser problem would be it's a, the defense was fine, the dissertation is basically fine, but there are some changes that need to be made. Maybe, maybe many little changes or maybe one big, like there could be a chapter, something like that, which would have to be changed. Okay, Or they could come back and say, the uh, defense was fine, the dissertation was fine, and congratulations or whatever Brian chooses to say in that moment. Okay? So, without further ado, we turn to uh, Jeff. Thank you, Robert.
I'd like to take the remainder of the time to articulately thank each one of you for all your influence in my life, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to take a moment because uh, we all share so many stories together and we weave ourselves into each other's lives with so many gifts. And I want to honor you and honor our ancestral lineage of the entire epic of the universe by sharing with you a song. This is a Shuar song. So I uh, invite you into this invocation to prism our panpsychic gratitude into all dimensions for a moment. So we feel uh, gratitude. This song is Makete Arutam Ni Shuari. This means Makete, I breathe my spirit breath of gratitude to you. Arutam, great spirit, Ni Shuari, all of our family, all your family. And in this, we're one. So here's a, a song to begin and to invoke, evoke, and send our gratitude. names, oneness is lost. Upon the naming of 10,000 names, oneness is gained. This anciently embryonic, shape-shifting riddle of distinction and unity is right at the heart of this dissertation and my life and my work. Our diverse, collective human heritage of indigenous wisdom and our Western science and all the inquiries, all the different ways of knowing that we have, have named our, have named these 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 names. And we ebb and flow sometimes. Sometimes we feel the oneness. Other times we name it and we, we don't feel it, but we can see it. So we keep naming. And our collective heritage has named so many incredible, complex transformations and transformative processes. Sometimes along the way, like I said, the ebbs and flows. One of the ebbs has been in the Western scientific, mechanistic, reductionist way of seeing the world has left many people disenchanted, not feeling a sense of belonging in an ensouled universe or being a part of the ensouled becoming of the universe. Mm -hmm. We've isolated things sometimes, and we don't see the connections to the whole. Brian Swim, my committee chairperson, he says this. He says, to tell the story of a single particle, we must tell the whole universe story. There is eventually only one story, the story of the universe. Every form of being is integral with this comprehensive story. Nothing is itself without everything else. Each member of the Earth community has its own proper role within the entire sequence of transformations that have given shape and identity to everything that exists. This is at the heart of this dissertation as well. I'm working with uniting the indigenous wisdom from experiences I've had among several different traditions. Uniting our indigenous wisdom with our scientific lineage, we're activated and we, we, can, we can ritually, poetically court 
the, uh, and name the exquisite literal and metaphoric analogous dimensions to our being and becoming together. Courting the interior dimensions of, of this, these ongoing transformative relationships between the parts and the whole. Ritual cosmological storytelling is one way to reverentially celebrate and name the 10,000 names. This is a really powerful time that we're in. So many traditions have spoken of this time that we're in. There are many prophecies about the numinosity of this time and the critical um, choice that the human family has. Many indigenous traditions talk about this time. Our Western scientific traditions and looking at our environment, looking at the earth, uh, there's a choice that we need to make. We can continue on a path of destructive, sort of disconnected, mechanistic, extractive economies and social structures and political structures, or we can choose to enter into a more symbiotic um, presence with the rest of our relations here. One of the prophecies that I'd like to share with you mm -hmm. is the prophecy of the condor and the eagle. As any of our indigenous ancestors and ourselves living in living and being here, we encounter life's processes and we develop certain affinities for the archetypes. We notice archetypes. We notice patterns in the natural world. We notice, uh, so we have elemental uh, affinities or alliances. We have uh, with, the, with the animal world, with the insects, with the birds, with everything that is, we have certain special intrinsic affinities and alliances. And so in South America, this prophecy of the condor and the eagle began it says that uh, the condor, the people uh, attuned to the condor energies and attuned to the eagle energies, and they found that uh, the condor represented the feminine and the ritual, the spiritual, the heart, a place of intuition, and that the eagle represented the mind and the material world and the human interaction with the material world through technologies and tools that we make. And they say that early on, the condor and the eagle soared together. And when tools were made, rituals were also performed. And there was uh, an acknowledgement of the spirit in all things. And so there was this communion. They said that over time, the human family separated a bit. And there became more eagle peoples and more condor peoples. This prophecy goes that at the end of the eighth Pachakuti, and this is one Incan uh, way of seeing the prophecy, which spread around. At the end of the eighth Pachakuti, a 500 year period of time, there would be a 500 year reign of the eagle peoples. The eagle peoples of the mind, the, uh, the, the masculine, the tool making. And so we see uh, that that coincided with about 1500. So for 500 years, a very strong reign of the eagle an industrialization of the, uh, of, for 500 years of the Americas and of much of the world. Mm -hmm. This prophecy continues to say that at the end of the ninth Pachakuti of that reign, the condor will almost have gone extinct and that it will be an there will be an opportunity for the human family to choose once again to unite and resuscitate the condor, the, the feminine, the indigenous, the ritual, the spiritual, and for them to soar again into a, a, a new, uh, a, a, an ancient but new way of seeing things. And together with the eagle, the rational, and the condor, the spiritual and intuitive, that we can uh, evoke a new, um, uh, a beautiful way of being with our relations. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, this prophecy of the condor has a lot of meaning because I was born right between the, the condor peoples and the uh, Eagle Peoples. I was born in Central America in Panama um, with the help of some of the traditional peoples to help my parents conceive as well. And uh, I was born among the Embena people, uh, raised among the Embena people and the Kuna people who I'll speak of in a minute. And uh, 
so for me, the joining of the heart and the mind, the indigenous and the Western science, and these traditions is very important for me. I wanted to share that with you. In addition, so many indigenous peoples are opening their sacred baskets of knowledge and sharing with us their ancient, uh, as Mircea Eliade says, archaic techniques of ecstasy. They're lifting their baskets of knowledge and sharing. The Council of 13 Indigenous Grandmothers and many other people are saying, let's, let's unite and let's share our teachings. The earth is in need. The earth needs us in this time. It's a critical time. So uniting our collective indigenous and scientific wisdom can inspire uh, the most articulate ethnopoetic courtship of the interior the interiority of the more than human world and, and with one another. Mm -hmm. Thomas is in terms of ritual and cosmological storytelling, Thomas Berry reminds us that analogy opens up the dialogue between the humans and the non-human. And we hear from these indigenous peoples that ritual is a portal to feed and sing up the worlds behind the worlds behind the worlds. I've been honored and blessed to have uh, participated, to grown up with and participated with uh, different indigenous traditions throughout my life. And it is with their, their blessings of these people and their teachings that I share these sacred ritual ways um, in my dissertation. And the point of all of this is to uh, continue the activation, the nourishment, and the blessing of our each of our sacred bundles of, of uh, ritual ways of being in this time. Mm -hmm. The four traditions that I'm going to share a bit of with you today are the Kuna people of Panama, with whom I've uh, lived and traveled to these regions throughout my life. Uh, the Kuna people of the Darien jungles and the San Blas Islands. And uh, they're a, a beautiful people. The the Quero peoples of the Peruvian Andes. I've spent a bit of time with them and have had a chance to have uh, sacred plant rituals and despacho rituals and um, compadrasco rituals with these people and their dear, dear friends. The Tsutuhil Mayan people uh, was through there growing up a little, very little bit, and then in 91, I spent a little bit of time there, and then over the last 10 years, Martin Preptel, an initiated teacher, healer, uh, chief um, of the Tsutuhil Mayan people, has been a teacher of mine as well, participating in his uh, Tsutuhil Mayan ritual cosmological storytelling events. And so I'll share a little bit about the Tsutuhil in a, of, of uh, Atitlan, Lago Atitlan, Guatemala. And then um, the Waitaha people, the Waitaha people of uh, New Zealand, uh, pre-Maori peoples. Mm -hmm. So to begin, the Kuna Yala, the Kuna people, are uh, beautiful people. I remember as a child growing up, um, and. The, the people live along the rivers in clearings. They live on the, on the earth. They sweep the earth. Uh, they sweep the, the earth where they live. But the MNA live on stilts. But these people, the Kuna, live on the earth with bamboo walls and um, thatch roof homes. I remember in the long house, like twice as long as this, a little bit wider, um, with poles in the middle, curling up in Nanshell, the great-grandmother of the village, curling up in her, in her lap, in her arms, with uh, a bunch of iguanas here uh, on the floor, a little fire over here, the whole place filled with people, and hammocks over here, and then her husband, Popshell, uh, singing stories, singing chants. And I remember the smells of the cedar smoke, and I remember the cadence of some of the songs, and then there would be a little break. The kids, we'd run out and then come back in. These are eight-day ritual cosmological storytelling events called the Nekapsoke. And they, this is a way of remembering 
our ancestral lineage of the whole universe. They believe that storytelling heals, <coughs> that if one person is sick, someone who carries that part of the story, mm -hmm, if they have a problem with their eyes or their head, they'll sing the story of the jellyfish all night to this person in a hammock. And that spirit will come in, they'll remember that person, they'll put that person back together with the story of the jellyfish, and then they'll be healed. Um, many other, so every, every ailment has that. But then for the whole, these are ongoing. The Nekapsoke are ritual cosmological storytelling events that are eight days-ish um, mm -hmm, that uh, reattune the human family with the more than human world with our ancestral lineage. Mm -hmm. The Edo people, whom I write about in my dissertation, I share a little bit here, um, they have, uh, their rituals are cosmological. The, the rituals are despachos. They're uh, gifts to feed the holy, gifts to feed the divine web of life that sustains us. And they listen to the, the land and the place, and they find that mm, for many generations that they've, the healers listened and they found the umbilicus of the universe. And many traditions have this, the Kosko, Cusco, where it is, the name, Osco is umbil means umbilicus, and this is a place where you can go to feed the universe. And so they make, and from that are radiating 46 energy lines, and then all in those ra radiating energy lines, there's 365 of them, one for every day. There's special places that the healers go to pay attention and feed, and they lay out uh, beautiful, complex uh, ritual. Mm, feedings of the, of the mother. They feed the umbilicus, and they're beautiful. And so I've had these experiences as well, to sit with these people, and based on their experiences, uh, based on my experiences with them, created an ecozoic despacho, um, tracing and feeding with some of our stories of the universe, and mm -hmm, finding ways to feed the invisible forces that are always uh, sustaining us. The Tsutu Hill Mayan people of Atitlan, Guatemala, um, with whom I have uh, studied a bit with Martin Prechtel over the last 10 years, um, they have this understanding also of ritual cosmological storytelling. They say that our bodies are the house of the world. They're a, a sacred building. In addition, everything around us is the house of the world and a sacred building for the spirits. Mm -hmm. The individual body and the whole cosmos. The gods, their original sounds, the gods and goddesses' original sounds and words make up the spiritual song of the world. And these sounds prisming into uh, one another make up the nervous system of the universe. Mm -hmm when someone is sick or when imbalance is happening, uh, what happens uh, is that the, the world house um, is being neglected. We're forgetting to feed the spirit, so it's being gnawed away. Um, and they, we need to remember to feed uh, the spirits and live in the sacred balance. <coughs> the healing songs, these uh, multiple day ritual cosmological storytelling events in which the universe is recreated uh, symbolically and um, with beautiful, beautiful gifts, um, starting with uh, fire and water and the elements and then naming all the many plants and animals and, and finding our alliances. These ritual events um, uh, are recreating the story of the universe in such a way that the the original sounds are sung, and we're reattuned to our, our um, innate sense of being part of the cosmogenesis, of being part of the living universe. And so these, these, uh, these sounds that we're making in these rituals are echoing off the original flowering earth, the original universe. And so we're reattuning and realigning with the original sounds prisming um, forth. The Waitaha people 
of New Zealand have a 12 night long ritual that's told during the night. They're rituals that open with the early part of the universe. The tekore, into the tekore, the, the, the great nothingness, the sun, the song of the sound. And then from that came the light. And then it continues and continues for 12 nights. They have these tapu uh, kete pofenua, which are the sacred baskets of ancient knowledge that uh, the, they're opened up for the community and they're portals of seeing into the universe and everything. They say that these karakias that they open each night with their sacred prayers that open the gateway to the third eye, to the consciousness of the universal mind, of the rainbow mind as they call it. And it's through these rituals that our, our minds and our hearts are open to the lineage that everything around us has to the wholeness of the universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. to the, yeah, the uh, opening the spirit, uh, the mind to the spirit trails everywhere. Mm -hmm. I have created in my uh, dissertation a, a ritual format, a ritual framework for uh, courting the uh, divine web of life, for courting the allies, for courting ecological archetypes and cosmological archetypes based on my experiences with these uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. created a, uh, an, a kuna ecozoic ika. Um, and ero, uh, 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 despacho, to feed the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in addition, I've uh, created a Waitaha song of the universe and a Tsutuho Mayan house building uh, ritual mm -hmm. and ceremonies. And the, the intention and the goal of these is to share them in courses, uh, graduate school courses for communities, for um, continuing the work I've been doing, for those of us in ceremonies, ongoing ceremonies, to find other ways to ritually court our ancestral heritage and our co-creative emergence and becoming. Mm -hmm. In addition, mm -hmm. there are other ecozoic cosmological ritual ways that I'm introducing um, based on um, nature awareness. As nature awareness, sitting in the natural world, having these as portals, opening us up to also communing with uh, ecological archetypes and cosmological archetypes. Mm -hmm. and so I, I say, may the condor and the eagle soar in us together again. May we uh, sharpen our minds and open our hearts and into the most beautiful poetic ritual courtship of one another and all of us in, in the more than human world as well. Remembering, putting back together all the beautiful iridescent strands of interiority and creativity that abounds all around. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to share with you about uh, my dissertation. Questions, and then Elizabeth will, will follow, and then and then we will uh, call upon you at that time um, for your questions. And all. okay, so stand by, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I uh, excuse me, sir. Yes, yes. I uh, yeah, my English is not too good, but I have my my wife. She can help me translate. It's okay. That's just wonderful. Great, thank you. Thank you. Jeff, uh, I, I, I love the way you um, use the phrase, the uh, courting interior dimensions. It's fabulous. 
I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, this question of multiple ways of knowing. So you're, you're exploring uh, reality. And is, there, is there one truth? Are there many truths? What's the relationship? In particular, um, would you say that that um, I mean the easy the easy thing to to put aside is that you're not saying that <coughs> the scientific account of the universe is the truth and the other accounts are, are just falsehood. So, but what what is the how do we talk about the the relationship between the cosmologies of, of say these indigenous people and the scientific cosmology? How would you talk about is scientific partially true, and these are partially true, or how would you begin to think? Beautiful. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> I, I would say that um, we are emerging into the ecozoic era in which it's a flourishing, integral community uniting previously um, at odds, perspectives, we're uniting a multiplicity of perspectives. They're, they're mutually informing. It's, uh, this is the time that we're in where we need all the different perspectives, even if one perspective really thinks, oh, that's, that's not true. For us to come together and understand one another and cultivate deeper empathy, cultivate even support the complexities of different understandings and ways of knowing. Um, so mutually supported. Mutually supported. Mutually enhancing. But is it, would you say then that, um, are they always both right? Mm -hmm. mm, that's a really good question. Are they both right? Mm -hmm. I would say that there's, there's room for us all and for uh, dialogue to come forth with us, even though we may think that perspective is wrong or misunderstood. Mm -hmm. When it comes to courting the interiority, for instance, indigenous peoples um, have ways of ritually uh, retelling the story of the universe and uh, remembering those uh, sounds, remembering the stories of uh, the lineage that's brought us into this time. And, and ritual engages that. They may not, it's a, it'll be uh, more metaphoric than some of the Western scientific lineage will say about this is the story of the universe, but they're um, both equally important for us. And I think for us now, in this time, to even with our story, predominantly coming from a, a Western um, educated perspectives often here, um, for us to find ways to draw from our the wholeness of our in, uh, of our ancestry and our indigenous ways of also finding rituals to engage the scientific knowledge that we have, and this is one of the things I have spoken of in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just push it this way: um, Is there are there aspects of the scientific account that are that are deficient? Yeah. Obviously, I think, the other question we asked about was, yeah, do the indigenous accounts need to be improved upon as well? Each disease uh, yeah. need to be improved upon. Yes, I think it's definitely <coughs> time. Oh, thank you. I think it's definitely time for us to support one another, and 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 yes, that the uh, the scientific perspective. I think sometimes in terms of framing it in the with the riddle. Uh, with the, uh, for, for instance, um, with uh, the Copernican revolution, I think that when Copernicus found in, that the earth wasn't at the center of the, uni of, of the universe and that the sun was at the center of the galaxies, that was a heliocentric model that we were sort of displaced um, in that sense, but then but that was scientific and we, we discovered that this is the way uh, this is the way it is. So things shifted, and that brought some disequilibrium. But it's an important journey for us that we're that we're on in this way. Um, hmm. 
difference, and I can see that maybe the indigenous tradition would correct that scientific disequilibrium. Is there a way in which the scientific traditions might correct anything in the indigenous wisdom? Definitely. I think that the scientific tradition, thank you, Robert. Um, I think that the scientific tradition is, is helping the indigenous community as well. It, it can, there's plenty of room for the uh, noticing, um, using the technological, the tools that we've created to observe acute details. Um, for instance, uh, I'm trying to think of a way to respond here. For instance, I was with uh, a woman who's uh, an ethnobotanist last week. I was holding some meditations in Michigan. This woman is brilliant. She's uh, working at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and she came out for a meditation. She's in uh, an ethnobotanist studying Tintantia in Southeast Asia, a plant that will heal uh, tuberculosis. And um, she's working with this and discovering um, through microscopic you know, lenses, these t the microscopes, finding and breaking it down into their parts, but uh, finding a greater language and uh, together a, a complex language. These people have their mythology and their stories, but tying it together with the breaking down the chemical components and finding, isolating it and finding that there's a beautiful solution uh, coming together. Um, this is one way that I could force, I could see the scientific tradition helping the indigenous people and sometimes we find that there are parallels between what science is uh, discovering uh, and their mythologies, many parallels in that sense. Um, Jeff, that's one. Okay, well that's exactly where I want to pick up because that's what I just wrote down. So, um, yeah, I appreciate really how you open this discussion and my questions are very much along the same lines and I, I want to get you to um, articulate for us more, a bit more specifically um, how uh, the indigenous traditions that you've studied with and the indigenous people that you work with, uh, how these insights extend and expand and um, bring into fuller being the Western scientific paradigm that I think most of us here are steeped in. And you mentioned, I, I thought that was very interesting, you mentioned that you um, were born on the cusp of these two, and I think that gives you pretty unique insights into both worlds, but not all of us have had that benefit. So, and you know, you can, you can uh, imagine me as a stereotype coming out of UC Berkeley, right? Coming out of the science department. And, um, so if I, if I or someone like me can't quite understand what the indigenous um, insights and wisdoms are bringing to our Western scientific understanding and ecology, how can you give me some specifics that tell us particularly what it's bringing? Let me see if I understand. You're asking if I can give you some specifics of how the, the Western scientific understanding Sorry, can you yeah, rephrase yeah, this sure, for a second? Sure. Um, so uh, you've started to, to address my question, and I, I want to some more details. Um, what you're proposing in your project and your dissertation is that the uh, indigenous knowledge and Western scientific knowledge can work together, right, to create a, a better understanding of the world and a, more, a richer, more harmonious, and probably more sustainable way of being in the world. Um, so I would like to know um, how the indigenous knowledge addresses some critiques that may exist of the Western scientific paradigm. And you've, you've written about these. Um, so if you can tell us some problems with the Western scientific paradigm and how the indigenous knowledge helps to address those, improve those. For example, uh, among indigenous peoples that haven't been exposed to and don't have the same uh, scientific uh, tools of, uh, that we have, they have other tools and ways of knowing, and these are often ritual ways or often consulting uh, sacred plants to see into um, what a person may 
need for health and restored vitality. And so there's a, a spiritual domain that's accessed through, through rituals and prayers and through a, um, a, a ritual poetic language that you're asking, you're, we're asking the, for the, maybe the healing of this person. And um, there's a, so through, through this, um, through this courtship and through maybe a, the, the sacred plants or, or rituals, we're, we're inviting the knowledge. And then the knowledge is received and then the person is uh, healed or the community is restored. Or it's not just about the human family, but also about the, the region we're in. When a certain bird among the kuna, when there's a certain bird that no longer sings in their region, as well as the embena, um, down in Panama, the Darien, when a certain bird doesn't sing, they'll leave the area and move to another area because it's imbalanced. And that's one thing if we're now in the Western, and, and with, with seeing the devastation in ecologies around the world, like we're at the end of the Cenozoic era, and the human um, element at the end of the Cenozoic era has, uh, we've brought forth this mass extinction in many ways from our industrial uh, disconnected <laughs> extractive economies, forgetting to honor the interiority, forgetting to ask like the indigenous peoples. And so now if we can incorporate that into what we're doing and court and ask and, um, and, and then receive, uh, it can be even magnified through the lenses that we have with um, all our technological tools and ways that we've uh, ways that we've created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, to follow up, um, can you tell us some of the specific critiques that you lobby against the Western scientific paradigm in your dissertation? The specific critiques that I'm lobbying against the Western paradigm of knowing is that often we've forgotten the, the interiority or the spiritual component and we've put ourselves at the top of a supposed hierarchy and we've, um, we've forgotten that uh, these are inhabited realms, the spiritual realms, and we've looked sh more short term for using, using the natural world for our gains. And so in the scientific community, um, over, the, over these last several hundred years, there's been, you know, the, like for instance, uh, Rene Descartes with the Cartesian dualism saying that there, there's mind and then matter and they're not, this, they're, not they're, they're separate and that everything is pretty much, uh, you know, it's a mechanistic, it runs like a machine. Um, that, has a long-term effect, and it, it um, takes away the sense of being in an ensouled, um, in, in an ensouled universe, in an ensouled uh, enchantment, of, uh, being sung like by the original sounds of gods and goddesses, the beings. And so, uh, remembering that, I think that um, that's one one critique that I have is, is really uh, forgetting the interiority, of the the more the human world that we've looked into. Mm -hmm. Is it, am I allowed to look at my dissertation or not? Better <laughs> <laughs> use it. Of course. I got a book here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add something that you had just found there? I would like to say that I, I not only have critiques for the Western scientific approach, but I have tremendous respect for the journey we've been on. I mean, not, we, we can only say we've needed to make this journey into greater distinction mm -hmm. and into greater wholeness. It's, we, it's, uh, this is the story of the universe. We have allurement. We're, we, we have our own creative impulse, and it drives us. And then cataclysm hits, and we're devastated. It's tragic. And then we move forward. Part, part of this uh, in honoring the Western traditional lineage is people like uh, Goethe. And his, uh, his, uh, he really brought back a lot of the you know, interior, honoring the interiority, like experiencing 
what were what the processes of research, experiencing them and encountering, brought back encounter into the into the inquiry. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just say, like for instance, I, I don't want to completely. I'm not. I'm just not dissing the Western scientific approach entirely. Mm -hmm. That there's been a journey that we're on, which is part of the cosmological journey mm -hmm. with allurement and cataclysm and then new discovery. So you find some um, redeeming uh, thinkers within the Western tradition, like Goethe, either, and probably Brian Smith. Uh, are there others that you would like to point to? Oh, yeah, um, definitely. Um, and let's see. For instance, um, gosh. <laughs> in Margulis in Symbiogenesis, the evolution of uh, what my parents have to see. For instance, noticing that certain, you take a cell of a jellyfish and you split it in half, it's like the air's tackle, and you split it in half, and then you notice that from those half parts, holes emerge. It's a miracle, it's amazing. And these are early, like, re reconnecting, oh, the parts are connected to the whole. In fact, the parts make the whole. Um, and then the evolution of the, the, the story of ecosystems and seeing uh, systems nested within other systems and um, the wholeness, seeing symbiogenesis, that even, even inanimate matter, these are early you know, uh, eco, uh, ecologists, you can study the ecology early on, seeing that um, Hmm. that even inanimate parts of the ecosystems, stones and other things, are equal parts of that ecosystem. They're, they're contributing, and that everything is in a, is in a symbiogenesis. There's a, um, an ongoing um, process of symbiosis where different parts are then acknowledged for their, for their role, even though they may not, we may not perceive them as an animate or spirited object. They're beginning to get that um, presence, and now definitely, like for instance, um, Sean and Bjorn Cargans and Zimmerman, they've written a book, The Integral Ecology, and they, they really share a lot of different perspectives on uh, emergent um, um, ecology and, and systems thinking, and um, in there. <laughs> yeah, so please, yeah. yeah. Well, you shared with us some um, some people that redeem the, the Western lineage, so I wanted to hear both sides of that, because I know that it's in there. I'm satisfied. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm on. Again. <laughs> uh, uh, this is your moment to ask uh, Jeff any questions you might have. Okay. Yes. I have a short question for him. How has participating in native ceremonies changed your life in your perspective? Beautiful. Participating in native indigenous ceremonies. Participating in native uh, traditional ceremonies for me has uh, has fueled my living tendril of becoming. It has fueled my way of being in this world so that I am um, more intent on and uh, yeah, I, I'm becoming more human, more alive. I'm cultivating myself. Uh, ritual, ritual space brings about uh, the deepest love. Indigenous ritual space brings about the deepest love uh, that I can feel and commune with. And um, for this, I'm eternally grateful. Um, journey, okay, I will say also that uh, this, the indigenous ritual ways have helped me to 
to court and to, to heal blockages in my ancestral lineages, certain patterns that I'm, I'm predisposed to. They've helped me to see these and to release them. They've given me tools to metabolize grief and uh, to mm -hmm, um, to be to be more uh, authentically creative in my expression and, and being here, and so many more things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gracias. Yeah. You you have uh, okay. I have one more question. Sure. Oh, what? Uh -huh. <coughs> Do you feel that scientists would benefit from participating in NARO ceremonies to expand their cosmovision? Did you understand that? No, what was that again? Uh, he said, do you feel that scientists would benefit from pre participating in native ceremonies to expand their cosmovision? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I believe, for instance, yeah, let me tell you an example. Um, Bethany Elkington, this ethnobotanist at UIC, she was asking me this question. I'm a scientist. I am working with this plant. I, I'm, she's in the last two months of her dissertation, and then she's got a postdoc thing lined up. She's fantastic, brilliant mind, amazing, and she's like, my heart is suffering. This is why I'm coming, because I feel like I've broken apart this plant, mm -hmm. and I want a way. So she came and sat with us in ceremony, in ritual, in traditional indigenous ceremony, and found a whole new relationship. And she, we've been in this just a week ago, and she said, there's a whole new line of communication opened up that I had no idea. We're here looking at it, and... Um, she said she's begun, uh, one of the recommendations is to set up an altar and to find ways to poetically feed. This is one of the ritual ways of the indigenous people is to, set al to make altars and set things in the center of an altar and <coughs> ritually feed it. For instance, taking Tintan Tia and putting it on an altar and then because it's in a scientific, in a lab at the herbarium at the Natural History Museum in Chicago, Illinois, in 20 Below, and it comes from Southeast Asia, to symbolically, ritually activate the nested ecosystem and region that it's in, to name them. Here's, here's your family. That's one way. And then to place things, to feed it, to say thank you for all your lineage, to poetically come up with the juiciest, most delicious words that you can to say, Tien Tan Tia. You've healed so many, your beautiful ways, all of your beautiful little tendrils coming, I can see them, you can sprout. Whatever it is that comes to your heart, to cultivate that language of ritual poetry is one way that she's feeding her relationship with this plant and that we can all feed our relationship with whatever we're doing is to, to engage in our um, poetic ritual language. That's what, uh, one of the things where I'm really hoping that uh, um, this dissertation will blossom. Gracias. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great. So we're going to use your cell phone. What do you think? Uh, they need to have a comment. If you, have, if you have an honest number, yeah, why don't you yeah. tell me you'll call me back on this one. Okay, we'll, we'll call you right back. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for me or anything you'd like to say or hear? Uh, Oh, relax. <laughs> <laughs>
people, these are our, these are our, we all have our ancestors and we have an indigenous soul that needs to be nurtured and fed, just like our mind is so curious and sensational. We have all of these ways to feed and the whole point of this is to, um, to mine meaning for myself, but also it's to share. It's, it's been, uh, for me, the process of this is to cultivate a gift that I can offer to the, our family in this time so that we can, um, yeah. So where's your books? How do we get to read this cake? Yeah, yeah. all right. Can <laughs> <laughs> you Yeah, well, uh, I am in the process, uh, uh, that's at a technical editor right now, and I'm in the process of, of putting it into less of a, it's, it's not a, I mean, it's academic, but it's actually not like super academic. It is, but it's, so it's, it's uh, putting it in a little more like, oh, this would be a, a nice, fun read, and, 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 and be uh, <laughs> 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 mutual encouragement. Uh, yeah. mm. Joy. Um, in some of these long sto retelling the story of the cosmos, the last yeah. eight days or whatever, yeah. do they reinvent the story, or is it always oh. It is an ongoing, unfolding thing, and there are different ways with it. The Kuna have long, elaborate, fairly, you know, memorized, but but living cosmologies. The Waita, on the other hand, theirs very much like meticulously. Uh, Tended to like they 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 don't change much. It's like that's it, and then on the twelfth night, this is when it's emerging, and this is when the twelfth night is like the celebration. This is the ongoing. This is the becoming. But everything that was before has its like its place, and it's um, really sort of strictly. <coughs> but some of these others um, are, are a little more a little more flowing, and the yeah like the uh, those that are initiated into carrying the old stories they're uh, they're initiated by the grandparents not your parents your parents don't actually teach you uh, those things it's uh, different yeah the grandparents do mm -hmm. Tony have, have you um, in your dissertation sort of done like a parallel story of universe where kind of how like a Western I don't know if timeline is the right description or a story, sort of like the Western story about where the universe comes from, sort of paralleling any one of, or maybe more of, or several of the traditional or native stories. So we can kind of see from like the beginning of time. Moving forward. I have, yeah, I begin like, um, and that's the, these are the dispatches of the Ikizo Ika, or, you know, and each night, let's say the, you know, uh, an eight night, Ritual begins with, like, say the you know the Big Bang and uh, the early particle epoch, yeah, and then from there it spreads into the galactic epoch, and then from there we look at the our solar system, the planetary epoch, and then into a chemical epoch on this planet, and then from a chemical epoch we journey into biological epoch, the life, all the life forms, and we look at that their lineage, and these are the rituals, and these are. Yeah, it's telling our story. So from then, the biological uh, era of you know, when did plants, you know, when did all this uh, emerge on the scene? And uh, this is a great book with uh, Brian Swim. Who wrote this book. It's got, I, I, I use that book a lot and several other books to kind of draw from and put, yeah, then after biological forms, we've got our own human heritage and our cultural forms and our when did we come along? And, mm -hmm. And so it's broken down into, into the, this sort of format. So that, uh, and they open in, same way, in, in similar ways. But uh, it's, it's more for, like these rituals aren't out there. Let me see how to say it. Mm. They're more to activate our own creative ritual spaces. They're not, like, it's not set this way. It's a general format, and these are some ritual ways, some ritual prayers to open with, and then it, and then we can be creative with how we, this is to basically activate our own ritual. You're, each of us has ritualizing way and ways in their unique and distinct. And so that's the, it's to basically support that. Mm -hmm. 
yes. Um, so I thought the story you were telling about the woman and the scientist who, the postdoc scientist who wanted to go deeper with the plant, I yeah. thought it was just a really amazing story. And just thinking about um, how to bring scientists in, and specifically like like a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical kind of situation <coughs> where they're using plants to develop drugs, they don't actually have any kind of relationship really with the plant. How do you see like? bridging that gap or introducing pharmaceutical companies or really mainstream scientists into a more indigenous perspective. Like almost like a like an indigenous department within the pharmaceutical company or an indigenous department within the mainstream science yeah. department in a school or something. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that's what Bethany and I were talking about and uh, on the way back from Michigan, and we're, that's exactly what we're saying, is that there needs to be some sort of like indigenous or alternative ways of knowing, ritual, sacred plant meditations, these ways of, of you know, uh, being with those spirits instead of just analyzing them from uh, ex, you know. Well, we've developed tools to go into the interiority, but in, without honoring the spirit. So yeah, uh, creating, ritual ways, like for her, she's now got this altar and she's sharing it with others and bringing other people. Now there's like 12, 12 of these ethnobotanists in Chicago that want to start having uh, ritual and ceremonial circles to support that aspect of it. And so, and now she, and she's got all these other friends and they're, she's like, <coughs> we need to do this. We need to remember the spiritual relationship that we're in and not, you know, like the pharmacology just distracting and making do you know what brought her in in the first place? Like what drew her to native ceremony? Her lineage was coming to, well, it was wanting to cultivate the relationship with the plant. That was, she's an ethnobotanist and she's studying one specific plant. She's like, I want a way to know this plant in a different way, ritual, some other way. And so she said, I need to see it from a different angle. And it was through a friend. She lived in, she lived in Laos for several years and um, studied there and, and um, was with the native peoples and would participate in their healing, but not so much in ceremonies. Mm -hmm. And she wanted another way here to engage that part of it. Mass. Yeah. Um, first, thanks, Jeff, for, for gathering these stories, because there's a mass extinction of species and of, of languages and cultures, and it's important to, you know, carry these stories forward and give them new life. Um, so my question is, uh, you know, you spoke a little bit about how you have been changed by some of these indigenous um, traditions, and I'm wondering if you've noticed ways that 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 the indigenous peoples are beginning to uh, change for better or for worse from from the West and from the scientific perspective and even the the economic market uh, that's always encroaching upon their lives you know in what ways are they being affected by what the West is bringing Stay there, right. and so introducing 
permaculture and you know different uh, skills of attuning to their environment in a more we have those skills like we've looked at we've lived in places and we, we have sustainable and regenerative designs for living long term in a place but they in their lineage they don't they haven't had it and so these are ways that we can definitely help long term sustainable regenerative designs Reflecting on this moment, I, uh, I remember our first meeting, and Jeff um, and Jeff contacted me and wanted to get together and talk about his his research ideas. And um, I remember we were we were driving somewhere. I forget where, but there's lots of water around. And um, he was explaining that he wanted to bring together. Uh, indigenous knowledge with the um, scientific understanding of the universe, and I, I never told Jeff this, but my, uh, I had, I had two responses inside. Uh, one was, uh, at last, mm -hmm. because so many people have been asking for this, me asking me for it, mm -hmm. right? And the other response was, um, thank God. It's you. And not you. <laughs> 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 because uh, take this on. It's a huge, huge enterprise. Huge. It's, there's so many different levels to the um, complexity of it. So many. And, and I mean, there. I could identify twelve, and, I, and I'm not even in my field, right? But any one of them could have uh, been your ruin. And actually, to actually find a way forward um, is, is an amazing accomplishment. You are, I, I, I've thought about it over the years, and it's, it, besides the, your intelligence, there's, there's also the amazing fact of your birth, just as you brought out. I mean, that is the way in which your destiny was, it began at, at conception of and then, but as well, the, um, the sincerity of heart that you've brought to this, Jeff, that's amazing. And the, the, the faithfulness, you've stayed with it, and every year I've seen you deepen. It is a um, kind of an amazing uh, process that, that some of us were part of, but you had to generate it, because you had to draw together so many components that were they were beyond um, PCC and CIS. And the last thing is um, your courage. Courage. Just to plunge into this without any idea, really, of how it was all going to work out and where it was going to lead to. Right? But now you are, I think because of that, one of the real leaders of our time. And um, already, as Jeff knows, when people now ask me, Oh, we want to have a conference and we can get a scientific knowledge and indigenous wisdom. I say, I've got the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, this is by way of saying that um, you, the committee has has uh, decided that you have passed your defense. 
and that with minor changes on your dissertation, you are going to be in, brought into the world of the PhD. Please join me in welcoming Dr. <laughs> Jeff Jenkins. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah, great. Perfect. You lead the way because you deserve the first drink. <laughs> 